Part 1. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello. Yes, hello. It's Tom Burlinson calling from Clean It Vacuum Cleaners. Mr. Sergeant, is it? Yes. I understand you recently purchased a vacuum from us. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Well, this is simply a call to find out if you've been happy with your purchase. Our company prides itself on its after-sales service. Just because you've bought from us doesn't mean you're no longer important to us. Could you spare a few moments to answer some questions? Sure. How long will this take? Well, not long at all, Mr. Sergeant. Usually only about three or four minutes. OK. What would you like to know? OK, great. I'll just go through the survey form, and uh, if you'll just bear with me, this shouldn't take long at all. Uh, OK, first question. Which model did you purchase, and when? Yes, it was the Super Cleaner. We bought it about two weeks ago. Uh, see, it was a Monday, I think, because my wife's birthday was on the Sunday, 24th. Uh, that would make it the 25th. Yes, August the 25th. OK. Now, do you remember the name of the salesperson? Was he worth remembering? Yes, his name was Jim. My wife and I were very impressed with him. He was a great source of information, very helpful. Great. I'll make sure that your kind words about Jim are passed on to him. OK, now let's see. Ah, yes. Have you purchased any other products from us this year? Oh, let's see. Uh, of course, we bought the super cleaner. I think that's all. Well, we bought some vacuum bags with it as well. Um, uh, I think Daisy bought some carpet cleaner from your store back in February. That's about all, I think. I have to ask my wife about that one. She's not here at the moment. No, no, that's OK. Your answer will do fine. We don't have to be too picky. OK, so how much money would you say you've spent, all told, in the store? Just an approximate amount will do fine. Wow, that's a difficult question. Uh, I don't really know. The, the vacuum was £150. The other stuff, I'd say around £15, I suppose the total was around £165. But I couldn't be totally sure. It may be a bit more than that. That's fine. That's fine. Now... The next thing on my list is how would you rate the quality of the products you purchased? Good, actually. Very good. So far, we've not had any problems with the products from CleanIt. Service and value have been very good. So I guess you have a loyal customer. Oh, wonderful. I'm really pleased that your experience with our company has been a positive one. Tell me, do you purchase any other items of cleaning equipment? If so, from whom? I'm very fussy about the interior of my car, you know. The seats and carpets, I found a product from Easy Clean which works well on the carpets and an air freshener from Mr Tidy that really smells good. Apart from that, oh, I couldn't say for sure, I think my wife buys floor cleaner from Johnson Brothers. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Well, we've just introduced a new line of car freshness. You might like to stop by. We'll offer you a 20% discount. OK, we're almost to the end of the questions. Now, I know you were happy with Jim, but overall, how would you rate the quality of our service? Fine. I thought it was good. The lady in accounts was a little unfriendly, but overall, I would say the service was quite good, actually. Jim made all the difference, and you certainly seem to be a very nice person. Oh, thanks, Mr Sergeant. Please, uh, Tom. Call me Terry. Oh, OK, Terry. Very good. Second last question. We're thinking of expanding our trading hours. When are the best times, the most convenient for you to shop? Oh, I'm not a shopper. I mostly leave it all up to my wife. She works full time. Let's see. 
for me, I guess I'd have to say Sundays between 1 and 3, and uh, I'm not working on Thursdays now, so if I had to, I guess, Thursdays between, say, 11 and 12 noon. OK. Last question, Mr Sergeant. Terry, do you have any other suggestions for us? Anything at all? Well, come to think of it now, there was one thing. Turn up the air conditioner. I seem to remember sweltering in there, and it was unpleasant and hot. Also, and this is just me, I always like to have some music playing, you know, quietly in the background. It just makes the place seem friendlier, you know, more professional. Well, I'll certainly mention that to management. Well, that's it. Thanks so much for your time, Terry. If there is anything we can do in the future to help you, don't hesitate to call us. OK, bye now. Yes, bye-bye, and thanks again. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You're going to hear a talk by a tour guide about the local history of Harbour Town. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the historic downtown area of Harbortown. I'm going to give a presentation on the history of the area before I let you all go. There's great weather today, so I'll try to keep this short. So, from this room, you can see most all of the historic area. This intersection is where the city was first founded, about 350 years ago. The San Gabriel River is wide and deep, and it was an excellent waterway for the movement of goods. Harbor Town used to produce lots of beef and oranges. Before the city grew, there was lots of open land for grazing and planting fruit trees. They traded these products with other towns and cities. The weather in this region is excellent for growing oranges because there are warm summers and mild winters. Citrus fruits can't survive in places where there is severe frost. At the height of citrus cultivation, there were over 500 orchards growing citrus fruit. Unfortunately, this fertile land also had lots of oil underneath it. In the rest of the country, new technology required the energy found in fossil fuels. After the first oil wells were tapped, agriculture gradually gave way to industry. The farms, orchards, and ranches that surrounded the town were replaced by new factories, cities, and roads. There is very little agriculture in the region these days, and certainly no cattle. The oil eventually ran out, of course, but other industries such as aerospace and entertainment were established. Well, that's a brief history of Harbortown. You can use one of the computer terminals available in the main office if you want more information. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. I will highlight some of the sites here just to give you an idea of what we have in the historic center of Harbor Town. You can then explore the area as you please. So, I've already mentioned the intersection where the city was first founded. The main east-west street is called Sunset Road, and the main north-south street is called Santa Monica Avenue. 
The central office we are in right now is at the northernmost end of Santa Monica Avenue. There are public restrooms here, as well as computer terminals that connect to the Internet. Across from the central office is the fruit market. At its height, people from all over the country came to buy fruit from the distributors there. If you travel south from the market and go past the intersection, you will see the Ranch Museum. Here you can learn about the old ranching lifestyle that was such a hallmark of our region. Now, going back to the intersection, if you go west of Santa Monica Avenue, you will find Old City Hall. It is an excellent example of the architecture of the time. In the opposite direction, going east of the main intersection, you can see Sunny Movie Studios. They don't make movies there now, of course, but it was the first company to make movies in our region. Also, the subway station is accessible from all four corners of the intersection. If you didn't take the bus here today, I am sure that is where you came from. Well, thanks again, and I hope you enjoy your visit to the historic area of Harbortown. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two engineering students, a woman in her sixth year called Linda and a man in his fifth year called Matthew, discussing the benefits of student work placements. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Hi, Linda. Can you spare a few minutes? Hello, Matthew. No problem. I just wanted to talk to you about temporary work placements. I've never really thought there was a good reason for doing one. I've got some savings, so I don't really need the money at the moment. But I've had an email from the university about a vacancy that looks quite interesting. You did a placement last year, didn't you? I did, yes. In my case, I wanted to find out if I was making the right career choice before I began applying for permanent jobs. I thought I wanted to work in car manufacturing, but I wasn't sure, so I applied to Toyota. What was the application process like? Lengthy. There were a lot of different parts to it. The dullest one was a psychometric test. You know, when you have to answer loads of questions about yourself. And you're trying to guess what's the best thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then there was an activity that we did in groups, which I found really fascinating. Engineers are renowned for being a bit unsociable, but I thought we made a great team. And we had an individual task, too. We had to sort through various business documents and prioritize them. It was just like what you have to do as a student, really, just with different content. What exactly were you doing on the placement? I was helping to design some diagnostic software to identify any waste in the car assembly process. Do you mean waste of materials? No, time. Anything that can speed the process up helps to cut costs. How did the work placement compare to being a student? Was it hard work? Yes, it was. I'd had full-time work before. I've done various unskilled jobs during university holidays, and some of those involve long hours. So I thought I'd find it easy. I was wrong, though. I think when you're on placement, you're always trying to prove yourself. So you push yourself hard to succeed? Yes. But I got a lot of support from my employers. They were always helpful. And then, at the end of the placement, I was given formal feedback. Do you mean on your engineering ability? 
Well, no, I didn't really need that because we had team meetings every other day. And so I had the chance to discuss technical issues and ask about anything that wasn't clear. The evaluation was about general workplace things, like organizational ability, initiative, that sort of thing. I get the impression you think you benefited from the placement. Well, the best thing is that they've offered me a job for next year. Depending on my exam results, of course, but still... A permanent one? Yes. But apart from that, I learned so much. The industrial environment was much more demanding than the academic one, so my general skills improved, like time management, meeting deadlines. And on the technical side, I learned new software packages, like MS Project. Well, I think you've convinced me that work placements are worthwhile, but... While you're here, can you give me advice on something else? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. I'm about to make a start on the engineering materials module, and I've got a book list here. Can you have a quick look and tell me what you would recommend? That's if you can remember. Let's see. I do remember some of them. Hmm. Yes, this one. The Science of Materials. I found the subject quite hard generally, but this book is very accessible, so it suited me. It doesn't cover everything, though. What about this one, then? Materials Engineering? Oh, yes. I do remember that. But it's a bit out of date now, isn't it? Unless it's a new edition. I don't think so. But what I liked about it were the pictures. They really helped to understand the descriptions. It's useful just from that point of view. Let's see. What else? Oh, yes. That one there. Engineering Basics. I think out of all these, that's got the widest coverage. But I've looked at the contents page and it hardly mentions nanotechnology. Yes, you're right. The evolution of materials does, though. It's a recent publication, so it covers all the latest developments. It's a bit thin on the 1960s, though, and that decade was quite important. Well, it sounds as if they all complement each other in some ways. I don't suppose you can lend me... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer giving a talk on cochlear implants. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. The topic for today's lecture is cochlear implants, which are a relatively new form of technology for assisting people who are profoundly deaf. First, let's revise how normal hearing works. If you look at image one, you will remember that the ear has three sections. The outer ear, or pinna, picks up sounds, which are then channeled through the ear canal to the eardrum, where they are transformed into mechanical vibrations. These are sent to the cochlea, or inner ear. Inside this snail-shaped tube, there are sensory hearing cells that have a variety of functions. The outer hair cells make soft sounds louder, 
and reduce the volume of louder sounds. The inner ear cells transfer this information to the auditory nerve and thence to the brain, which interprets the input as sounds. This sophisticated and sensitive process allows us to process a huge variety of auditory input. For those who are profoundly deaf, the system functions poorly or not at all, and the brain does not receive the input it needs to process and interpret sounds. Image 2 shows how a cochlear implant works. You can see that the implant has three main parts. The first external part, behind the ear itself, is the microphone, and at the back of this you can see its associated speech processor, which is a tiny computer. This analyzes and digitizes sounds and sends them to the transmitter, which is worn on the head. Those sounds need to be converted into electrical impulses so that they can be sent to the cochlea. If you look carefully at the image, you can see that just under the skin, directly behind the transmitter, is a surgically implanted receiver. This receives the sounds from the transmitter. It converts these sounds into electrical impulses, which are sent directly to an electrode array that is implanted inside the cochlea itself, thus completely bypassing the ear canal. As you have seen, a cochlear implant does not operate in the same way as the ear, nor, in fact, as a hearing aid. In cases of mild hearing loss, hearing aids can be very helpful. They simply amplify the normal sound waves as they travel down the ear canal. However, they generally cannot overcome severe hearing difficulties, and this is where cochlear implants come into play. So, what are the pros and cons of using a cochlear implant? Well, firstly, cochlear implants can deliver significant improvements in hearing for some users, and some people report dramatic improvements in the perception of individual words and sentences over the weeks and months after an implant. However, a cochlear implant is not a magic bullet that works equally well for all users. The sound signals that the brain receives from an implant are quite different from normal ones, and this means that the user has to relearn how to hear. Many users report that speech sounds robotic after a cochlear implant, and the degree to which people can adjust to this new kind of hearing varies hugely with each user and situation. It is important to understand that a cochlear implant is not a cure for deafness and that the user is still deaf. Especially for a child, an implant is a long-term commitment involving lengthy and intensive training. The user must learn to reinterpret sounds and will likely need to augment this with speech therapy so that people in the community can easily communicate with them. The implants work much better in quiet situations than in noisy ones, so they still need to learn to lip-read and to use sign language. The surgery itself is not without risk, though it has greatly improved since it was first performed, and there is some possibility of damage to facial nerves. Another disadvantage of a cochlear implant is that the surgery may remove any natural hearing that the deaf person still retains. This takes away the possibility of using a hearing aid should the implant not be effective. For this reason, many users have implant surgery performed on only one ear, the one with the least natural hearing. So, who is best suited to receiving an implant? Many factors impact on this decision. The most significant one appears to be the duration of the deafness, and, as you would expect, those who have been deaf for a long time generally have lower success rates. The second related factor is how old the patient was when they became deaf, and maybe more significantly, whether they had learned to speak before they became deaf. Those who become deaf postlingually generally have better outcomes. Another factor is the health and structure of the cochlea and how many nerve cells the user retains. This is related to the cause of the hearing loss, and recent research is exploring how the spinal ganglion, or nerve cells, are affected by disease. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.